Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Key Trends in Food Service for 2011 <coughs> webinar. During the presentation, all participants will be in the listen-only mode. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please use the chat feature located in the lower left corner of your screen. If you need to reach an operator at any time, please press the star followed by the zero. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded today, Thursday, May 12, 2011. I would now like to turn the conference over to Valerie Kilfer, your moderator for today. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Emerging Trends in uh, Food Service Industry, a roundtable discussion presented by FastCasual.com and Empathica. I'm going to introduce our panel in just a moment, but first I'd like to remind everyone to stick around for the entire presentation, at the end of which you'll have the opportunity to submit a question and have it answered live by our, our panel. Uh, if you have a question, please type it into uh, the chat box on the lower left side of your screen and we'll hold on to that um, until the end of the call, but feel free, to, um, feel free to ask your question at any time. We've got three restaurant industry veterans here for you today. Mark Williamson is the Executive Director of Consumer Insights for Applebee's. He is responsible for overseeing and directing the company's strategic research of sales, traffic, guest satisfaction, food development, and marketing. We have Jeremy Morgan, Vice President of Strategy for Smash, Smashburger and its parent company, Consumer Capital Partners. Jeremy has seven years of strategy experience in retail and business for consumer brands. And we also have Gary Edwards, Chief Customer Officer for, of Empathica. Gary is responsible for the oversight of client management, marketing science, and retail insights for Empathica. And again, I'm your moderator, Valerie <coughs> Uh, we've seen a lot of changes to the restaurant industry over the last several years, and today we're going to discuss five evolving trends impacting restaurant operations. The trends we'll be discussing today include customer experience management, social media, mobility, employee engagement, and dynamic segmentation. Each of our panelists will be asked several questions in regard to each trend and how it has impacted their company's operations. Again, feel free to ask your own questions at any time during the presentation. You can do so uh, by submitting the question in the chat window on the lower left side of your screen. Let's begin today with a look at our first trend, customer experience management. And with that, I'm going to turn the podium over uh, to Gary. Thank you very much, Valerie. You know, I'm so delighted to have uh, you here, Mark and Jeremy. Mark, you've got over 1,800 restaurants in the U.S. Um, and I know this last quarter you've been ramping up a new customer experience program, and the experience itself at Applebee's is a key strategic focus for your brand. Um, now, success has many fathers, as we all know, but I'd like to suggest that your focus on operational quality, improving the experience, and your focus on uh, some real renewed marketing is certainly paying off. You had 3% growth last quarter of 2010, continued growth into 2011, and much of this based on revamping and revitalizing what is uh, it just an epic, stable brand of, of North America in Applebee's. So congratulations to the success and just dying to hear more about how you're using uh, all these emerging trends to make sure that Applebee's as, a, as an iconic brand in North America continues to be number one casual dining chain. And then Jeremy, you've got Smashburger, very different concept. Uh, you, you, you folks are certainly brave in staring down the critics. Just going into recession, you open up a brand new concept and while we're seeing discretionary spend, you had this idea that, look, we could actually charge more for a burger. We could focus on high quality. We could build an experience around going to a burger joint and actually make it a lot of fun and engaging. And we could change up what's typically a quick service model into one that's kind of a crossbreed between quick service, but you get an extra little bit of uh, service and attention when you're there. The story here is fantastic. You went from zero to 95 restaurants in just three years. And this year alone, we're planning on almost doubling with another 85 slated for growth. So double-digit growth, a phenomenal growth story, and I'm so looking forward to hearing how you're capitalizing on these emerging trends to <clears throat> continue to be successful into the future. Now let's let, start looking at some trends. Here at Empathica, we've been polling over 10,000 Americans and Canadians and asking them a variety of questions on their spend, on their intentions and on the service levels that they've been getting. And candidly, this last year, as we've been going through a very difficult recession, the news has been difficult. 
for most consumers, there's a belief that service standards are lowering. And what we evidence, and part of it is just very intuitive, is that there is this rock and a hard place that you as operators have to find your, what yourselves through. Now, that rock and a hard place is this. If somebody used to go once a week to a restaurant, now they can only afford to go out once every two weeks, their service demands actually increase. If they're being more careful with what they spend, they actually want more return for that spend. Very difficult place to find yourself and to actually, as both of you have done with your great brands, experience growth uh, within this. How have you done that? I believe that you've done that as an observer and a, a participant with these brands as making experience your key differentiator. So with that as context and the success of our two panelists here, Valerie, let's, let's introduce our first question. Okay. I'm also going to um, ask it the, uh, this question of our audience, um, and that is, does your company currently have a customer engagement management program in place? Um, click yes or no, and then um, you'll see the responses on the left. And I'm also going to um, start um, this question with Mark, and that is, you know, how much emphasis is put on the customer experience in uh, your operation with Applebee's? Well, yeah, thank you, Valerie. And for all the reasons that Gary mentioned earlier, um, we recognize that there are strong economic headwinds that are impacting our guests and their dining out behaviors. And consequently, the guest experience, we're seeing that as being a key differentiator as an opportunity for us to set ourselves apart. And in terms of the mindset of the guest, when they're getting ready to make that decision to go out to dinner, we want to be top of mind. We want to be, them to have memorable experiences in our brand. So consequently, the guest experience holds a very strong place in terms of our strategic initiatives, as well as on that balanced scorecard that we are looking at uh, from a financial perspective, from a guest perspective. It holds a strong place and strong value in terms of what we're looking at uh, and the mindset of our consumers. So it holds a, a very high place in our initiatives. Okay, and Jeremy, how about uh, with Smashburger? Well, at, at Smashburger, you know, the way, the way we think about our business, what we're really selling is a better burger experience, um, more than just a better burger itself. And so customer experience management is one of the most important things that we do. And we're constantly monitoring that customer experience really in a variety of different ways. We, we use the Empathica surveys extensively. We use our mystery shops. E even out of the store, we'll do things, uh, other online surveys, focus groups. And as a young brand, uh, we're still regularly making minor refinements to, to what we are and wanting to maximize what the customer experience is. And you know, as you're, as you're looking to build, uh, for a brand like us that's looking to build store, so many stores in the next 12 months, we want to make sure that with every, every next store that's being built that we're, we're developing the concept to be everything it can be for the guest. And so for us, you know, the, the CEM programs are really um, a core competency that, that we think has really helped us succeed in the marketplace. Okay. It seems our audience actually agrees too is, uh, you know, we had 55 of 87 respondents say that they did have um, a customer engagement program in place. So um, it, I think industry-wide it, it seems to be that um, other operators would agree with that. You know, what I love about all of this, Laura, and Jeremy, Mark, is you're using great new technology, but you're using it to be something very old-fashioned, which is you're running strong local restaurants that have appeal in your neighborhoods, have appeal to people who um, want to come out and feel that this is part of their community. Um, the other thing that I've been enamored with with both brands, as different as you are, is you're using this technology to not only do the obvious, which is you've got really pretty dashboards, you've got a you know, electronic alerts that can go right away. And there's lots of this kind of inundating um, this new world of, of software. But there's also something, again, that I think is very old-fashioned that you're using technology for, and that is to reinforce the right behaviors of your frontline staff. So every day when somebody does something fantastic on the floor of an Applebee's or in a Smashburger, you send out a wow alert. That wow alert gets printed and put up on the wall, and that's how we start our next shift, which is pointing to Folks, here's what we're doing to make sure we satisfy our guests each and every day. So what I'm really excited for both brands is using these tools, but using them in an intelligent way to reinforce the culture that you've created around building great customer experiences. Yeah, and Gary, to that point, at Applebee's, I mean, from a CIM perspective, we have 
the opportunity to go in and create strategic initiatives and around some of key areas of focus that we want to look at for the brand. And then from that perspective, driving it all the way through the brand down to the frontline staff. And to your point, in our survey, it's very interesting. We have trigger points within the survey that actually can electronically send um, raw reports on things that we're doing really, really well from a guest perspective straight back to those servers and let them know to recognize that there's really great behavior going on here. So we want to be able to recognize that. Then also on the flip side of that, where we have um, opportunities for improvement, guests are letting us know, and through the survey tool as well, we're sending electronic alerts back out to the management team to let them know that there's a, a rescue opportunity with particular guests. And from that, they're able to pick up the phone, call the guest, and do some guest recovery right there on the spot. These, these tools have been able to help us coach on behaviors that are less than desirable and then recognize those and motivate team members in and around the, the good, strong behaviors that are creating those great guest experiences. And interestingly, I was just on a call this morning with our ops council, and they were talking very specifically about their WOW reports and how they're being used. So they're tacking these reports up on in the back of the house. They've got um, tracking boards that they're using. They're doing public recognition in front of their other peers. They're talking about the best practices and the behaviors. So it's instituting great motivation and a great culture in terms of creating this hospitality we're looking for. Those are awesome and, and, examples. Mm -hmm. well, and Jeremy, you know, um, what tools does Smashburger use? You know, what do you think would most benefit or has been most beneficial to the operators and guests? Yeah, you know, we, we utilize the same type of things um, that, that Apple does. We use the, the alerts um, both to reinforce great behaviors and to, you know, try to rescue customers that have had a bad experience. Um, and we found that to be uh, incredibly useful in reinforcing. We get um, a lot of uh, a lot of comments um, that come through, both uh, you know, overwhelmingly positive actually, which is a great which is a great tool for us to to really coach our employees on. But more important, we also put processes in place to make sure that we are uh, in a very time efficient manner uh, communicating back to any guest that's had any sort of uh, problem or issue in our stores. And we think that's a that that key part of the feedback loop is just incredibly important because if you give someone the opportunity to uh, tell you that something went wrong and you don't get back to them, that's making a not so great experience even worse. And um, alternatively, uh, or conversely, if you reach out to somebody and can really impress them with your, how quick your feedback is and you know, ask for a second chance and find a way to get them back into the store, you can actually turn what a poor experience may have been into a very, very loyal customer. And that's, that's the best thing that, that you can hope for. Um, for us, the other thing that we do, we actually really do um, try to let customers engage with us how they prefer. So for some customers, they love to uh, fill out the surveys at the bottom of the receipts. Other people like to get on our website and send web comments. Some people get on social media or, or send a Twitter. And we're, we look for ways to consolidate that feedback so, the, so operators have a single point of contact um, that they can either log on to and view and have a way to respond back to their, uh, respond back to their customers in, in one point because there's a lot of different things to manage. And, uh, and even though that can be difficult operationally and add a lot of complexity by having all these different feedback channels, ultimately uh, you don't really get to choose how your customer wants to communicate with you sometimes. And so being responsive in all those different channels is, is important. Okay, well, and we did get um, a question from the audience that I think now would be a good time to ask, and that is, um, you know, and, and Mark and Jeremy, you can both comment on this, and, and Gary, if you have some suggestions too, but, you know, is this technology that you're using done through the POS, through your point of sale? At Applebee's, it definitely is. We have, um, we, we offer the invitation to take our survey on 100% of the guest checks that come through. And ours, ours is the same way. So we, we, uh, we have it on the bottom of every single survey, and, or sorry, every single receipt, and we actually offer um, customers an incentive to do that on every single receipt. So customers have the opportunity to uh, have a free side uh, of their choice on their next visit if they complete the survey. Okay. Good you know, Valerie, a, another point to make on 
you know, collecting the wows and collecting service rescue opportunities is the actual opportunities and or the behaviors associated with each of those different areas. And from a strategic perspective and an operational perspective, it gives us an opportunity to really dive deep in terms of the pain points um, within the operations and course correct accordingly. And if we see themes that are associated, major themes are associated across the system, it's a great opportunity to pull back and perhaps course correct a system or a process that might be broken. Um, and conversely, over there where we're looking at WOW reports, these are the great things we're doing to create, you know, delighted guests. And from that perspective, those themes that are coming through that are shareable across the system to build best practices upon, um, to create standards around, and, and really driving home the point that service levels, um, we can have extraordinary service levels, and these are the things, the behaviors that our team members are doing across the system to drive that. Okay. Well, and I will say I'm getting um, a ton of questions about this topic, and I think they're all very good. Um, I'd like to save them for, for the end, and then we can go back and ask a few for, for each one. That's um, great, Valerie. You know what, what I'd say is what we're seeing is that CEM tools are ones for coaching and campaigning for improvement. So while the world has been inundated with more and prettier dashboards, I think the really actionable feedback we're finding is when the results are framed up in such a way that it's a coaching moment for the frontline team and that you're operating campaigns for improvement in overall operations. We will come back to many of the good questions the audience is asking, but let's do that at the end and make sure we can get through the other four trends in food service. Okay, great. And with that, we will move on to um, social media. And uh, Gary, I know you have uh, a lot to say in, in this regard to get us started. <laughs> Thank you. I'll keep it brief. Hey, Mark, you've got over 760,000 people who like you. Well, at least they, right. they, they, <laughs> they like Applebee's on Facebook. Uh, it's fantastic. Um, and Jeremy, I've been really impressed with the cult following you've been able to build at Smashburger. You have over 37,000 fans for, for a company of uh, you know, just under 100 restaurants. That's fantastic. 3,800 followers on Twitter. And what I'm finding interesting is, We've been asking your customer, or your guests rather, who love their experience at the end of our operation survey, if they'd like to post using a Go Recommend application. Those numbers look great. 3,500 posts, reaching over 770,000 eyeballs on Facebook news feeds. On the Twitter side, over 8,900 followers reading great tweets that your customers have posted. And all these numbers, what I'm really excited about for Smashburger, it all is that all of this social media activity is directed at not just the brand, but that local store operator, that local restaurant operator. So I'm curious, you know, with all of this attention we're, and positive press that we're able to gather, I'd love to hear, especially your thoughts, Jeremy, in terms of what you're doing on these fronts. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, we, we do several things on social media, and I think, you know, and, and a lot of brands are doing that today. Um, we're only three years old, and when, when we started, we had, uh, you know, only one or two or three stores, obviously, and social media was really about the only cost-effective way that we could reach out. And for us, it's really um, about making it a, a local experience for people. So we actually have Twitter accounts in every single individual market rather than a smash burger master uh, Twitter account that, that allows guests in Sacramento to communicate with uh, the Smashburger community in, in Sacramento. And so we do that everywhere. Um, on, on Facebook, obviously, we've, we've put a lot of attention into you know, making our, our Facebook page as, as good as it can be, and I know that a lot of people out there are probably trying to figure out what their social media strategy is as well. And for us, we think about social media as a conversation more than anything else. It's not a one-way communication tool out to our guests. Um, and it's also really a lot more about engaging our most loyal customers. Um, the kind of people that follow you on Twitter or Facebook uh, tend to be your most, avid, your most avid users. And so it's important to make that fun, make it two-way, um, and really uh, find a way to do everything from responding to customer issues to asking a, you know, a, you know, what they would like the next LTO to be. I mean, really make it an engaging experience uh, so that people want to come back and, and continue to uh, pay attention to what you're talking about in that space. So, so as a trend, though, also, though, Smashburger supports you know, the employee and guest use of social media. 
Oh, of course, yeah. I mean, for sure. I mean, I think that, um, first of all, if you don't support it, you're kind of running yourself up against a brick wall because your, your guests are going to be using social media to talk about you no matter what you do. So, I mean, our philosophy is to embrace that, and, you know, sometimes that can be chaotic. Um, but really, um, ranging from encouraging everything from our store employees to join our social media pages and become a part of that conversation to, um, you know, rolling with the punches when someone tells us that they had an accurate or an inaccurate order. I mean, all those things are, are really just part of it. And we really found that um, because it really is our most avid users that are on those on those pages, um, we tend to get, uh, when, when issues do come up at all, they tend to really come to our defense more than we ever need to ourselves. And it, uh, it's, a, it's a really reassuring thing that if you you just open the floodgates, uh, actually a lot of good things can come from that. Well, I'm going to um, actually ask, uh, ask our next survey question, but don't think that's the correct one, so we'll move on to number two and have, uh, have um, J Jeremy and Mark take a stab at this one. And, and, you know, and Jeremy, I'll have you lead off, and that is, in what ways can operators encourage the use of social media tools, you know, among staff and guests? I mean, you yourself said, you know, that the guests will come to your defense if, if you get a, you know, a, a bad review or if, if something negative is, is discussed um, about the chain. So, you know, do you, what does the company do to encourage that interaction as well? Well, we, you know, we do, we do a lot of things, and probably, um, you know, none of them are a silver bullet. I think there's a lot of social media sites out there, and, you know, you do your best to try to stay on top of the ones that, you know, your brand deems most important. Um, for us, Twitter is one of those, and as I mentioned previously, we do have an account for, for every single market, and I think customers appreciate that, uh, appreciate that a lot. Um, if we run a special that has to do with the Rockies game, only the people that are following our Colorado Twitter account have to listen to it and hear about it. So it becomes a much more relevant conversation for them. Um, you know, further, you know, we, we do put um, a lot of emphasis on um, making sure that uh, we're thinking of, you know, we, we put the four square signs on a lot of our stores where, where managers think that that's an important thing for their place. Um, we will also um, do focus on online reviews and think that that's an important part of the, the conversation as well. Um, we engage Yelp bloggers and um, really try to make sure that they have uh, a good experience in our stores and, you know, go and tell people about it and try to make fans out of them. And so really, to me, though, I mean, any one of those tactics um, don't feel as big as, you know, what your overarching media strategy might be or something along those, along those lines. But, you know, when you add up all the little things, it really becomes really a word-of-mouth strategy more than anything else. And I think as we all know, word-of-mouth is ultimately the most powerful tool in the toolbox when it comes to a marketing program. Okay. That's great. And now um, I'm going to interject real quick and say here's our, here's our poll question. So um, for members of the audience, you know, we'd love to hear from you um, in regard to your support for employees and guest use of social media. Um, and um, Mark, your company is just now starting to look at social media tools. What are your thoughts on that, and you know, what do you think needs, needs to happen? Well, and to Jeremy's point, social media is a piece of the media strategy. And I think from a restaurant perspective, we're all just starting to scratch the surface in terms of how to use this. And we have a pretty significant emphasis in and around Facebook and engaging with our guests and fans, if you will, on Facebook. And going beyond just having a specific conversation, you know, recently, this last week, we've actually launched a new application where we're having our guests who are fans of Facebook actually, it's called Girls Night Out application, where you know, they can actually connect with their, their friends on Facebook to set up a, an event in one of our restaurants. So it's going beyond just having a dialogue with them to actually connect with them to drive traffic into our restaurants as well. So applications like that are, are relatively new and very exciting for, for the industry. And um, to, to be able to connect with, with guests, have them connect with, them, with their friends and drive that traffic is a prominent opportunity for us. Okay. Well, and this is um, a question that I got from the audience that I think both of you could answer, and that is, you know, who manages your social media effort? Is this done by a marketing person, an operations person? Um, you know, and, and how have, um, you know, buying sites such as Groupon affected the marketing strategy, if at all? 
Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start with the first one. Those are obviously uh, <laughs> two different topics, but I think um, for us, we've actually, you know, again, we're, we're pretty young and we're still trying to figure out what the, what the best way of going about it is. We've taken a few different approaches and it, uh, it seems to evolve a little bit over time as our different markets get more mature. Um, we have, um, in some cases, local PR agencies in specific market that will manage um, the social media accounts on our behalf. Um, we frequently have um, field, field marketing people that are literally live and breathe in the market and they um, manage those accounts, particularly for our franchisees. Um, that te seems to be a common approach. Um, on the more holistic level, on the, on, the Facebook, on the Facebook page, which is a more national account, we do have a person at the corporate office that um, sets that strategy and works with uh, some folks to make sure that um, you know, we're posting regularly and being responsive and things of that nature. So really I think the different, you know, social media is a pretty big umbrella actually, and the different channels kind of uh, within that lend themselves to different people that might be appropriate to manage them. Yeah, and it sounds like we're structured very similarly um, where we have a team within marketing that actually manages our social media. Then we also have field marketers that work directly with um, the restaurants and our franchise partners on their, their, their strategies. Is that something that you, um, that you had in place pr prior to um, establishing a social media strategy, or is that something that kind of came to be as you were developing that strategy? For Applebee's, um, uh -huh. it's a very recent um, development. The past year, we've actually started the strategy along with a, a team. So it, it, the strategy didn't start within the team. We had it all come into place together. Okay. And then, Jeremy, how about for Smashburger? Um, well, I mean, I think that uh, for us it was a, a bit of a um, – Figure it out as you go approach, and you know, in some places, uh, you know, and, and we're and we're continue, continually adjusting that. I saw a question just came through about, you know, do we feel comfortable having local PR companies handle this facet of the business? And you know, I think that um, the answer to that is yes, uh, but the answer is it also took um, some training of those PR firms. It took um, some ability for us to to let go of some of that control. Um, you know, for us, the alternative option was to not be responsive or not use some of the channels that we thought were important. And, you know, ultimately, um, you know, there's, you, you got to make those trade-offs. And for some brands, I think that it probably doesn't make sense to hand that piece of the uh, puzzle off. And for, <coughs> for brands that make, and for us, it has made a lot of sense so far. Okay. And then what about the Groupon aspect also? Is that something, um, and Mark, we can start with you, and then Jeremy, have you answered the same thing. Is that impacting your marketing strategies at all? You know, um, I'm going to have to defer over to Smashburger on that one. Sure. I'll, uh, we, so so I, for us, Groupon um, hits our marketing strategy in two ways. Um, one, obviously, you know, it, it falls under the what is our overall discounting strategy. Um, as everyone knows, it's a, it's a pretty steep discount whenever you go and uh, do a Groupon of some sort. But really, we, we think of it more about uh, as, as part of the media puzzle. And... Um, I think that positioning it that way helps us get our arms around um, what are we getting for what ultimately Groupon gets paid. And in, when you layer on what kind of discount strategy we're comfortable with, it helps us structure what kind of offers we think might be reasonable, um, how, many, how many vouchers we're willing to sell, how frequently we're um, willing to, to run these kind of things. And we've really just begun to scratch the surface with these sites. There's obviously there's Groupon, but there's also Living Social and um, several others out there, frankly. And there's a lot of eyeballs that are getting those kind of emails every single day. And ultimately, for us, it's it's another way to get to grow awareness and to to increase trial. Um, and you just have to get your arms around um, what the best way to utilize those channels are. That that's not gonna not gonna blow your marketing budget. Yeah, well, and then one thing with social media, and as we see by our respondents um, to, to the question in support of it, it's something that, you know, operators definitely feel is, is important to their, you know, operations and to, um, you know, increasing the footprint of their brand message. But it also ties into our next topic, which is mobility, and that is, you know, uh, reaching customers where they are and having customers talk about your brand, whether they're in the store or on the street. Um, so with that, well, I think this is a great time to segue into 
um, you know, connecting guests with, with mobile. And um, Gary, you want to take it away from Sure. Here? Well, social media isn't the only cool kid on the block. Um, what we're seeing <laughs> across the board is tablets. It's got to be the year of the tablet, right? The iPad's coming out with, number, with version 2. I got myself uh, the BlackBerry Playbook. And we're seeing lots of Android options out there. Um, all of these are slick. They're great interfaces. And I think the surprising thing on the iPad too has been how many executives have bought these. So it's not just a consumer tool. It's become a business tool as well. When you think about it, I think Apple was a little surprised. But then when you think about it, what does an executive need uh, communicate a device like that for? And it's primarily with communication and a slick, engaging communication device for their email and for uh, busying themselves on a plane certainly is a great idea. But for the restaurant operator, let's take a look at that. What does the year of the tablet mean for them? I think what it means for them is you can take essentially a clipboard and make it electronic. And once you do that, lots of innovative ideas come to mind. Um, there's lots of advantages that are offered. So in addition to our interest, which is, hey, it's a cool, interesting way in the moment to survey customers, we're now seeing use of it for in-store audits, um, for using mobile solutions to make sure that uh, restaurants are being held to the standard that, that they should be. And in order to do that, what's great about mobile devices is you can get what we're calling right time reporting. So you want just the right amount of digestible information served up just at the moment you need it before you go into a, into a restaurant. And so principally the application for this is for that multi-unit uh, coach or manager who's going to be visiting many different restaurants and making sure everybody's up to a standard. So, Love to hear from Jeremy and Mark. I, I know it's an emerging trend, but what your thoughts are in terms of the future for tablets and mobile devices for your restaurants? Well, from a multi-unit manager perspective, it's here to stay. Um, I'm seeing more and more increased demand for the use of this, and our area directors that are traveling from restaurant to restaurant that are on the road as much as they are, having access to that information in the palm of their hand is, is a key tool to them these days. Um, they love pulling up to a restaurant, seeing their scorecards, being able to have a very specific conversation with them right there on the spot. And um, so the tools are enabling those, those very unique conversations that they're having. In addition to that, we're seeing, you know, like with these WOW reports that we're seeing going on, the, the traveling multi-unit manager is a, taking those WOW reports and actually forwarding on to um, from their smartphones, from their iPads, and forwarding on right on the spot back to the restaurants and, you know, giving praise, giving recognition right on the spot. So uh, it's, it's, it's an opportunity that um, is going to be ever-growing. I, I'd echo a lot of that. I mean, I think, you know, currently, so, so first of all, it's definitely an emerging trend. You know, the iPads themselves haven't been along, around for very long. And there's no question that it's a great tool for the, the multi-unit manager of some sort. Um, we're a very data-driven driv company, and our operators use that to really help drive performance in the stores and do a lot of the reinforcement of, uh, of things to, to the GMs and the, the employees um, when they're there. And, and having that at their fingertips and being able to, to download and access the information and to be in touch with, with their bosses and, and the corporate office as they're um, going through is, is really an important, engaging thing. Um, I think the other thing that we've you know, just scratched the surface on really um, is w the ability to start to use some of these tablet things as almost a, an, additional, uh, an additional POS in the store. Um, we don't have a lot of urban locations today, um, but you know, in, in uh, stores that get a line out the door, things like that, I mean, these iPads can really be used as a device for, cus for uh, cashier to add an extra cashier and almost really add another cash register to the store. We explored it a little bit in one store, and we're, we're trying to figure out how that works for us. Um, but you know, certainly I think that there's something there to uh, helping manage speed of service and also make a very interactive and, and cool guest experience at the same time. Okay. Now, um, for the second question, I know this is something that you're just you know scratching the surface of both of you. But do you see mobile technology? You know, where do you see mobile technology headed in the future? And you know, what what kind of impact do you see this having on food service operations, especially with you know online ordering coming on and and mobile ordering and um, and curb, curbside delivery? Well, I think that's an interesting perspective because 
like Jeremy said, I think we're just starting to scratch the surface in terms of technology. And, you know, the guests have this need for convenience and something that we need to solve for. And, and I think the, the technology will help to increase our accuracy and our speed, but also put the, uh, the experience in the guest's hand. And, you know, there's tabletop solutions out there for ordering and for payment that are being tested and, and used. And, you know, tablets are being tested for this. Handhelds are being tested. Um, there's gaming going on out there to help guests with interaction with one another, to connect with one another. Um, you mentioned online ordering applications. Those are more and more prevalent. So all these mobile applications uh, tend to be uh, a great tool for our guests, but also from operations perspective as well to help create the increased accuracy and speed that we need to, uh, to help out the guests. And, and I'd, I'd echo a lot of those things. I mean, for uh, you know, if you look back ten or even you know even ten years ago, um, really the the one way that a customer had to engage with you was to uh, you know you might have a website on a digital in the digital front, and then now you know you have to keep a mobile website and maybe have a mobile application, and that application both of those things need to have you know potentially some online ordering capabilities, and you need to be listed on all the local eatery uh, things, and you know, people are really using their mobile devices to uh, m more than ever before to to get information and to figure out exactly where they want to eat and, and where they want to go. And so, uh, I think that you know, again, just to reiterate, it's just kind of scratching the surface. And I think we'll find over the next five years that there's going to be some pretty key players emerge. Um, you know, similar to the fact that you've kind of got Groupon and Living Social as the big two. Uh, uh, daily deal sites. Um, I think that there are going to be a couple really big players in the mobile space that restaurant companies are going to have to figure out how to integrate those players into their to their strategy, or, or potentially risk being left behind in some regards. Yeah, we're we're definitely seeing that. You know, as um, on Fast Casual is watching the industry, and we're seeing more integrate mobile ordering with online ordering, and, and tablets especially are showing up more in restaurants. So. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it's going anywhere. Um, okay, well, and um, the other thing that mo mobile does and tablets, um, you know, per Gary's, you know, initial introduction in, into this topic is, um, I think it's also driving employee engagement, um, and so let's let's kind of move on to that one and then um, um, kind of explore that topic too and, and how it all fits together. Well, yeah, Gary, you know, the interest, sure, absolutely. You know, the interesting thing about the engagement side is we can use much of the same technology as you uh, just stated to tap into what's the employee mindset just as we track the guest mindset. And that's absolutely critical to managing ever growing, ever successful businesses as we're seeing at Smashburger and Applebee's. But there's one important difference, and we always have to remember this. When we're tracking customers or guests, we're looking at transactions. And when we're tracking employees, we're really tracking the quality of a relationship. And those two things are very different, and they, they drive different sets of actions in order to make sure those employees stay engaged. Just to state the obvious, why do we need to keep them engaged? We need to keep them engaged because they're our frontline defense against customer or guest attrition, and they're the ways that we're going to have people tweeting and Facebooking and telling others just in this modern age the way people do, but have always done about great guest experiences. So the employee is absolutely a critical and essential part of running a great uh, restaurant business. Keeping them engaged, especially on the front line, is important. And you know, what we've evidenced is, look, here, to put it in simple terms, that front line employee has to be engaged so that they can win for the guest. That's the obvious piece. They have to be able to win for the brand. They have to be able to stand up for what the brand values are and personify them. And they have to win for themselves. They have to feel good during and after each shift, feeling that they've won and their life has been enriched in some small but important way by the quality of the interactions that they have. So we need employed, sorry, we need engaged employees on the front line, and they've got to win for all three. Now, candidly, winning for two out of those three, you can win for yourself and you can win for the guests. Say, yeah, I wish it wasn't that way, but that's just the way we do it. Well, in that little scenario, the brand lost, and that person isn't personifying the values and the belief in that brand. They've got to be able to stand up for what that brand stands for and personify it. And they've got to be able to deliver a great experience. And if you find the right talent and you're measuring people and 
helping them to be engaged and get positive feedback. Right back to the wows that need to start every shift that both Mark and Jeremy were speaking to earlier. Then you can create a culture where you've got this three-legged stool of wins that we believe is absolutely important. Um, <clears throat> how important, let's ask our panelists, how important is employee engagement to your company culture at Applebee's, Mark? Well, it's foundational. And you know, it's going back to the service profit chain. If you have you know, happy employees, you have happy guests, it translates to happier guests and the bottom line in terms of profitability. And we know in the restaurants in terms of setting that culture, if you don't have a management team in there that is um, creating the culture, uh, it makes a miserable experience for your team members. And then from that perspective, it translates and transfers directly into the guests and their perceptions. So we want to make sure that our 100,000 employees out there that are guest facing, that um, they are an engaged group of individuals that have are bringing a sense of pride and sense of uh, community to the neighborhood at Applebee's. And with that, <clears throat> those attitudes that they have, um, they play a huge part in how the guests are feeling about their experience. It translates, translates directly into that. So um, we, we recognize that it's, it's a big opportunity in getting our arms around not only the front of the house, but the back of the house as well, so they understand how their role translates over into the guest. And it's not just cooking, but it's how do you, how do you make guests feel based on what you're cooking. So um, across this system, from a management perspective, from front of the house and back of the house, it's, it's um, key and foundational for everything else going on. We know that if the team members aren't behind their promotion, they're not going to sell it. If they're not behind the food, they don't understand the food, they're not going to be able to sell it. So we want to make sure that everybody is engaged across the system. Okay. And Jeremy? Yeah, I mean, at Smashburger, really, um, as I mentioned in the first question, we're really selling a better burger experience. Just, it's more than just the product. And therefore, the employee engagement with customers is really a big, a big part of that, if not the most important part of that. Um, and a fun, vibrant company culture is really a, nece a necessity for delivering a fun and vibrant experience for your guests. Um, we encourage our employees to do a lot of uh, it's really the little things. Uh, provide thoughtful recommendations. Check in with customers. Refill their refill their uh, cups for them. Uh, bust their tables. The things that you might not expect from a uh, from a from a quick service burger burger joint or a five minute burger experience. Um, it's those little things that can really wow a customer. From a from a corporate standpoint, we also try to engage our employees um, with relevant incentive programs that. Um, make a lot of sense uh, to, to, to make sure that they are helping to sell our LTOs and make sure everyone's really on the same bus and uh, driving towards that great guest experience that um, ultimately makes for a, a loyal customer base. And then uh, as we see, a few people answered our survey question, so I've got that up. And um, while we look at the results too, I'm going to um, ask Mark and Jeremy our second question. And, you know, and that is, what can restaurant operators do to engage this, this new generation of employees? We hear a lot about Generation Y, and obviously employees you know, span more than je that generation. But you know, do you, are you seeing differences in how you know, um, the company interacts with staff compared to five or, t or ten years ago? And you know, what requisites do you look for in employees now? Sort of an interesting question because to some degree there's a lot of similarities in five to ten years ago in how we approach people today. Um, you know, people want to be treated, sort of the golden rule, be treated like you'd like to be treated. And they want to do. They want to come in and do a good job. They want personal growth, and they want recognition for what they're doing. So, creating a system and a culture where you're you're able to to perpetuate that kind of um, attention to your employees. Um, I hear a lot of times when I'm out talking to employees about what do you want, and there's like, well, I want like the family-like environment. So, being able to connect them to one another, um, be able to c connect them with the brand. Um, through clear understanding of what the values are, what the culture is, huge piece of the puzzle. But also, I'm hearing loud and clear from our operators is if you want to drive the engagement, a lot of it is through recognition as well, driving recognition to motivate our employees. Okay. Now, I think that you know, while the, this generation of employees is definitely 
different than maybe the generation of you know 10 years ago or 20 years ago. I mean, probably the most important thing we do is make sure we're hiring the right people up front um, to make sure they're the ones representing our brand well. And almost everything else is, is really easy if you get that right. And that's not to say that that's easy, um, but if you're able to get that piece right, um, then uh, you know, the rest of it kind of comes right along with it. Um, the interaction with employees probably is a little different than it used to be, and that's you know, ranging from something as simple as uh, communicating schedule changes through text message or uh, you know, th things of that, that nature, but fundamentally the job is the same, which is to, to make a great guest experience, to serve the customer their food, and to kind of get them out as, you know, uh, as efficiently as th that customer wants to get through the store. And, you know, I think that while this generation is a little bit different, to, to me, um, the, it, it kind of goes back to management 101. If you can, if you've got a good GM and you've got that, that that's a motivating person, and you and you hire the right cashiers and cooks in the back of the house, then um, you know this generation doesn't behave fundamentally different than than those in the past, and you're able to get the results you need. Okay. Well, and then you know, how do you establish you know what you're looking for, the characteristics that you want an employee? Is that something that you leave up to um, the hiring manager, or is that something that you establish as a company? Um, Mark, we'll start with you on that one. Well, it's, it's interesting. I mean, we have to define who we want within our restaurants that can match those expectations of the guest. So, if you have you know guest needs, you're saying I need. Um, a strong personality, a bubbly personality from our servers. I need smiles. Um, those are basic fundamentals that you can go out and recruit for. I've been in, in roles and, and different brands that um, uh, they're, they're very adamant and they're relentless about who they hire. Because to Jeremy's point, if you don't hire the right people, they will not be able to fulfill the guest needs. Um, it's one thing to have a, a, a host that opens the door and welcomes you to Applebee's with a frown on your face, and another that opens the door that has a natural smile and makes you feel genuine and warmth and uh, creates that, that welcoming environment. So if you have the innate nature of those individuals and you're screening for that right up front and you're relentless about it, on the back end it does make the, the – you don't have to train for that. It's, it's innate in their behavior. So um, <clears throat> it's one of those where you have to understand what the guests are looking for and be able to hire for that as well. It makes the job on the back end so much easier. I just add, you know, you know, I think we've got a question from the audience around, hey, what if you don't have an HR department? I think it's a great question because I want to yep. point, out, point to something here, which is you know, this is not the job of HR. This is really the job of to hire great people, you need great managers who are coaches at the front line. So I think as important as getting the front line right, you've got to get managers in who really love to play the role of coach, who have an eye for talent, and then like to be on the floor giving the small steers every day, just the visible to guests, creating a great experience, and then giving the small kind of coaching moments uh, for all of the front line staff throughout the day and throughout shifts to make sure that the guest stays number one as the priority. So just want to make a point, it's not the role of HR. That's really the role of the local store manager, local restaurant operator, to make sure that this is a priority in her or his life uh, each and every day. Yeah, and, and you know, we try to equip our, our GMs with the right tools. So I mean, it's, it's a little bit tricky when um, you know, we're, half of our stores are corporate owned and half of them are franchise owned, and ultimately those franchisees um, are responsible for hiring their own people. Um, but, but it is important from a branding perspective that a guest have a you know pretty consistent experience whether or not they go to the Smash Burger in Texas or the Smash Burger in San Diego, and so we try to set at least um, some guidelines as to what what does a Smash Burger cashier look like or what does a Smash Burger uh, cook look like and what are their attitudes and what's their behaviors and um, you know and and really what are some of the key characteristics that we find important and then we provide you know some some interviewing tools that you know at least make sure that that people are thinking about the right kind of things or asking us a similar set of questions um, things that we think really help us um, uncover that you know the people we're talking to do have the right characteristics and I think by by just uh, investing a little bit in making sure you got some of the right tools in place can really help make sure a you get the right people um, but b you consistently get the right people both across geographies and across across uh, your different store locations. Absolutely. Maybe I could use that as a segue. Um, 
across restaurants, across locations. We've got another issue which is across occasions and kind of different need states within the restaurant. Cognizant of time, I wonder if we could tackle, uh, Valerie, our last yep. trend which is this dynamic segmentation. I've already given away a little bit, but the context here as I see it is, you know, from those front, you find great talent, you measure and manage them every day with great feedback directly from the guests using new tools. And then the challenge is how do you drive some subtle but very importantly different behaviors and sometimes even different standards through different occasions uh, and sometimes different need states of your guests. So obviously lunch, you know, where everyone's task oriented coming from, uh, from a business environment is very, and there's a 30 minute window is very different than the after work crowd or people who just don't have the time or inclination to cook dinner tonight and want to go hit an Applebee's. Um, Mark, Jeremy, how do you tackle this dynamic segmentation? Well, it's very interesting because to your point, Gary, um, there's day parts that we have to address, and then there's occasions within those day parts that we have to address. And day part analysis versus occasion-based analysis <clears throat> gives us a, a, a clue into what guests are looking for. So to your point about lunch versus dinner, um, at lunch typically what we see is people want to get in. It's a very functional kind of meal service. At dinner it becomes a bit more about the experience. And even within dinner we see that you know, guests are, are, there's many occasions that guests are coming in for dinner. So what we, we, we have done in the past is to take a look and dissect at each one of the different day parts, um, wanting to know exactly you know, from a, a guest perspective who's frequenting the restaurants, who are they, and what do they want out of that experience? So we're looking at PMIX data, we're looking at traffic patterns, and even taking the guest satisfaction data and looking at that um, by, by day part. And from the guest satisfaction data, we can actually do key driver analysis by day part to define exactly what's most relevant uh, within each of those different segments. So you've got that piece sitting out there. And then within those day parts, we want to understand the reasons why people are coming to the restaurants and what those expectations are of those occasions. So um, for dinner, for instance, you can split that open and look at multiple different occasions within dinner and get really clear in terms of articulating need states. And then from that, driving behaviors and restaurant behaviors um, to deliver upon those need states. <clears throat> so it's going back to a lot of the guests are saying, I want you to read my occasion and be able to deliver the experience based on that. So if they want you know, to be able to linger um, of their food service, how do we pace the food service so that they have the opportunity to linger? If they want us to be more engaged in conversation, more engaged with their experience, um, how do we read that occasion and connect with them on different levels? So um, there's, there's multiple ways of looking at the data, of cutting the information, so you can clearly articulate how you want to approach the um, service delivery in and around the day parts and in and around the occasions. You know, we, we take a, a similar approach. We, we may not be as sophisticated as, as Applebee's is just because we're, we're really um, almost just cracking the nut on this one to figure out exactly how to go about it. But we definitely look at different occasions behaviors. And, you know, for us, because we're so young, it's been a top priority of the marketing and strategy departments to, first of all, define who our, our core customers are and what are the different occasions that people come to Smashburger for. And, I mean, honestly, if your companies haven't gone through that exercise, it's, it's a pretty important piece um, so that you can, once you know that, then you can go through and find out what the right behaviors are um, for uh, your restaurant employees to ga engage customers with. Um, and and it's the way that we've gone about that is we really do triangulate a lot of different data sources. You know, we use credit card segmentation information, online surveys. We use our Empathica point of sale. We, we look at mystery shops. Um, and, and really, those different, uh, those different data sources might lead to slightly different conclusions, but you know, there's some things that they really all start pointing in the same general direction on, and that's when y you know that you're on the right track. I know for us, one area that's been a specific focus for us is around first-time guests. And you know, on any given day uh, in most of our smash burgers, um, a, uh, you know, half the guests, are, it's their first time in the store because our, our concept's still pretty young. 
And so we've, we've trained some specific behaviors with our cashiers and with our people that deliver the food, and even in the back of the house with the cooks to you know, take extra precaution on order accuracy and things like that, so that when, when it is a first-time guest that they do get a differentiated experience and the kind of experience that, that makes them want to return. Because um, ultimately that's what you know, business building is all about, building up uh, uh, that loyal customer base. Absolutely, Jeremy. You know, so from what Jeremy said, Mark, I'd be curious. Your job is a tough one. You get insights from your guests. You get feedback. Uh, let me ask you a loaded question. How can you get 90,000 people? I think you've got over 90,000 uh, employees out there. How do you get them to wake up tomorrow and do something different today based on what guests are saying um, using the tools that you have at hand? Well, you know, that is. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, that is an arduous task to wake up you know, and change your behavior. So what we ha are having to do is clearly define what guests are expecting of their experience and through that creating the behaviors associated with it. So you know, we've got areas, we're, we're driving key areas of focus. We've got three top things we're going to work on this year, and that is pervasive through the entire system. So we're all focused on driving very specific behaviors and around these key areas of focus. You know, one of the things that we're, um, we're actually just getting started on, we're in the process of rolling out, is we're, we're integrating our um, point of sale survey um, with really a prescriptive reporting mechanism. And what it does is it, it, it basically tells the uh, store managers what is the most important thing they can go work on that's going to have the biggest impact on uh, the customer experience over in the next month. So, for some stores, um, that might be the number one thing you can do is improve the cleanliness of your of your uh, of your floors. Right? I mean, literally, it might be as singular directive as that. And for other stores, um, you know, once they've got the clean floors thing figured out, which hopefully doesn't take them very long to figure out, they they move on to providing a thoughtful recommendation to the guest when they come in, and uh, that's the the most impactful thing. And the and the way that we got to the hierarchy of that list is by running a you know, fairly extensive um, loyalty model that has a lot more statistical analysis in it than I could possibly explain or do myself. But we basically used Empathica to help us think through what um, what that what that loyalty model is. What do we think all the potential key drivers of our business are for our customer experience? And basically, we went online and we tested it, and uh, we were able to to come up with what that hierarchy is, and then. Um, we adjusted our point of sale survey. We're adjusting our point of sale survey to be reflective of what the most important things are to the guest, uh, measuring those results. And then as we get the results, um, stores are automatically given the uh, to-do list or top priority list of things that they need to do over the next period or quarter. And um, we're excited to see what that does for us. It's something that, that's going to be going into place this summer. And I think that um, you know that's one of the things that uh, – Helps, will help us to be more reactive because a lot of it will be automated. Because you know, if you had to have someone scratching away at the desk, um, figuring out what to do in each of 100 stores or each of 3,000 stores, depending on how big your chain is, um, it is an arduous task, if not an impossible one, if you don't find a way to, to put some automation around it. Yeah, and to Jeremy, add to that, I mean, that's sorry. one of the key things I hear from the operators. Their question is, tell me what to do. What is it I need to go do? And from that perspective, the loyalty models that you guys at Empathica actually built for us clearly defines what's most most important to our guests and how well we're performing on that. So from that is where we actually define those key areas of focus to go work on. And to your point, Jeremy, about the reporting, um, we've got KPI scorecards sitting out there that are just very specific about here are the three things to go work on. And we're monitoring and measuring against that. And I mentioned earlier we have a balanced scorecard. These KPIs roll up into that balanced scorecard to keep the entire organization focused on delivering you know, these three areas within the, uh, the business. Great examples. You know, this notion of prescriptive reporting, or I guess the headline is one size doesn't fit all, I think is very powerful. So you use scorecarding to then make sure that the right scores and the right actions are delivered up rather prescriptively for each store or restaurant. That's key to success and for actually making change performance improvement within your restaurants. Yeah, I want to thank our participants today, cognizant of the time, Mark and Jeremy. It's been uh, wonderful to be your colleague here 
uh, on our webinar. I know there are lots of questions that were asked that we weren't able to get to, but I want to make a promise to our audience that we're certainly going to we've recorded these, and we'll certainly be happy to get back in very, very short order to each of you with the very good questions you asked. Valerie, anything else to wrap it up? Yes. Yes, uh, I, I can do that. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you, Gary, Mark, and Jeremy, for your time this afternoon. Um, again, if there was a question we didn't get to today, um, we do have a log of it, and we um, it will encourage our speakers to reach out to you to have that question answered, um, So, uh, if they have the ability to. Um, and also, for those of you who would like to view the slides again, we will have an on-demand version of the presentation available as soon as we close out of here today. Um, again, um, and you will receive email instructions on how to listen in again and how to access the, the presentation again, the PowerPoint. Um, and I just want to say thank you again to our speakers, Mark Williamson, Jeremy Morgan, and Gary Edwards. And uh, to all of you listening in today from all of us at FastCasual.com, have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That does conclude the webinar for today. We thank you for your participation, and we ask that you disconnect your lines.